Well, can I on all our behalf thank uh, Professor Stocker for his presentation. It was uh, both clear, but it shows what a major achievement the IPCC's uh, uh, fifth assessment is. And I think the way he began his presentation, uh, showing that there were 259 uh, scientists from 39 countries, and the approach that you had taken in terms of the openness and the number of comments, shows what a robust piece of science this is. And I think in discussing uh, with uh, officials in my department and, and others that I've met since you uh, released your report, it's probably true to say that this is the most robust, most peer-reviewed piece of scientific work that's ever been published in human history. Uh, that is the extent uh, of the uh, rigour that's gone in. Now, of course, good science, as uh, Professor Stocker showed, is, is rightly cautious. It's testing the theories. It's understanding the risks. There will always be uncertainties when predicting changes in complex systems, particularly <coughs> complex chaotic systems like uh, climate systems. My background's an economist, and I can tell you that uh, uh, predicting the economy is quite tricky, and uh, you get it wrong a lot of the time. Uh, I, I, we're the dismal scientists, um, but I think climate change scientists have shown with the rigour of this report that uh, a lot can now be uh, predicted with much greater certainty. And indeed, the IPCC's work has been built on actually 200 years of science. There are quite secure foundations, of course, in the, uh, the physics, but also in the observations uh, that we've seen laid out uh, for us today is a truly comprehensive uh, report. I think its conclusions are quite sobering. Um, and the message is indisputable and it is extremely clear. The world is warming up. Much of that is down to us. And if we don't act, we are on the course for a very, very dangerous world over the next century. So I'm not going to waste uh, much breath addressing the denial of the Flat Earth Society. Uh, theirs is a dangerous dogmatic adherence to a fair weather fantasy. But let me speak directly to those who are attracted to a message of slowing down action to tackle climate change, or indeed stopping uh, the action altogether, including those in the British Parliament and elsewhere. I think the IPCC report shows the issue is how you reduce emissions, not if. And however much we would like it to be otherwise, the scientific reality is compelling us to act. I think when you have this discussion in politics, it's as if some of us want climate change to happen. <laughs> None of us want climate change to happen. We wish it wasn't happening, but we cannot deny the science. It would be irresponsible and negligent to do so. So climate change isn't a fantasy, it's not a conspiracy, it is already happening. And you can see it all around us. The timing of the seasons changing, that's what the farmers tell us. The weather more extreme, and of course, we just had the hottest decade on record. And it was because the last generation dithered that we've left it too late to stop climate change completely, if we ever could. All we can do now is to limit it so the effects are manageable for our children and for our grandchildren. And this coalition government has said that we believe it's our duty to pass on to our children an economy that isn't burdened with debt, that is a prosperous economy. And I believe it is our uh, very solemn duty to pass on a planet that can uh, sustain them. And that will require us working, not just, of course, in this country, but uh, around the world. And, there are people who seem to think that we can just wait and rely on some magic bullet technology to emerge out of the blue. Uh, I have to say I think that is irresponsible and dangerously risky. We need wide-ranging action now. We cannot uh, delay. And that will mean politicians around the world leading, not following. It will need, mean that we need to listen to the science, put the policy in place, and then convince others to follow, and that is what the UK government is trying to do. Of course, uh, the UK has led in many ways. The UK Climate Change Act, the first comprehensive legislation of its kind, 
that's been successful in playing a part in reducing carbon emissions here by 28% on 1990 levels. And I actually want to pay uh, tribute to the cross-party consensus in the UK, led by the last government, to get a commitment to a low-carbon future. Um, but much of the Climate Change Act aspiration um, has now to be, has still to be delivered. And you can set targets and you can pass legislation, but actually it's down to practical reality, the nitty-gritty of actually doing it. Um, and in the carbon plan that my department uh, published uh, three years ago, two years ago, we set out how we believe in the UK we can achieve an 80% reduction uh, by 2050. And it is very ambitious, but we've got to progressively decarbonise our energy sector, our transport sector, our heating sector, our whole economy. That is uh, the challenge. And it is at this point, when you're getting down to the practical nitty-gritty, not just setting targets and passing legislation. It's now when the going gets tough. The difficult decisions have to be made. And it is not a time for faint hearts or wobblers. It's not a time for gimmicks or sticking plasters. It's not a time to talk down our ambitions or to scare off investment. As Margaret Thatcher famously said to President Bush, the time of the first, first Gulf War, this is no time to go wobbly, George. <laughs> we must stick the course we have set. Government is putting in place one of the most far-sighted, comprehensive, ambitious and sustainable energy policies the UK has ever had. The energy bill before Parliament has a very ambitious objective, and I sometimes think that we forget the level of ambition that is in that energy bill. We want to revolutionise the UK's electricity market. We want to build the world's first ever low carbon electricity market. It is a radical green intervention and it adds up to the biggest overhaul since privatisation in the 1980s. Its core component <coughs> is about bringing forward investment in affordable low carbon electricity uh, generation. And despite all the discussions that you hear in the press and in Parliament, um, I was very proud that at the third reading of the Energy Bill in the House of Commons, uh, nearly 400 MPs voted for it and only eight voted against. And that is actually a strong signal to people that when it comes to building that uh, uh, ambitious electricity market, there is political consensus. It is essential to provide the confidence that's needed, the legal financial framework that's needed to provide the certainty that is essential to attract that investment. Because our goal is to make the UK one of the best places in the world to invest in low carbon electricity generation. And we want to match that ambition on the supply side with ambition on the demand side to dr in the drive to save energy too. Uh, we want the UK to be a world leader in energy efficiency. And I want the UK to lead in Europe. The way I see the run-up to the critical climate change talks in Paris in 2015 is that we really have a huge opportunity. We have the science. It's unquestionable. We actually have in China a new leadership. I'm not sure if enough people have noticed. I've just returned from a week in China. And their attachment to building an ecological civilization is really clear. And that's partly driven by air pollution and the need to tackle that in their big cities, their growing huge cities, for the health of their people, for the quality of lives of their people. But they know the connection between local air pollution and global air pollution. And I think we are seeing in China now easily the world's largest investor in clean energy. We are seeing a country that is ready to move and could move very fast. In the United States, I think in President Obama and Senator Kerry, uh, not sorry, Secretary of State uh, Kerry, uh, we have two American politicians who understand climate change and who are willing to give a lead. 
So if you see that in China and the United States, you see that in Washington and Beijing, it's vital that the EU that has provided leadership uh, in recent years continues to provide that leadership. And my concern is that there are forces in Europe that are putting on the brake. And so it is even more important that the UK takes a leadership role in Europe. Um, earlier this year, I set up something called the Green Growth Group of Ministers. Uh, now we have 14 member states, and we are members, uh, our countries are all share in common a high ambition on climate change, and we're working together on the key issues. The reform of Europe's carbon market, the move towards uh, getting new targets for the 2030 uh, energy and climate change package. The UK has already laid our cards on the table. We now already have the cross-party agreement from the coalition, the most ambitious targets proposed yet for those 2030 targets. We are saying that the EU should adopt a target of 50% emission reductions by 2030 as part of a global deal in 2015. So we have to lead, and we just have two critical years to provide that leadership. But I think if we can keep the political consensus together here in the UK, we will be able to provide that leadership. I think we can bring Europe together so we can take the opportunity. We absolutely have to. I think the IPCC report is a reality check. I think the science has spoken. And we must now use this as a catalyst to renew our efforts and meet the threat of climate change head on. I don't think anything else would be, could be described as responsible. We now have that duty. And everyone who reads the science has that duty too. Thank you very much.